My name is Bronwyn Williams. I'm a futurist, economist, and trend analyst, and the host of the show titled The Small Print. Now, in The Small Print, we try to unpack exactly that, the hidden terms and conditions, the nuances and the unintended consequences behind the popular, less popular, and populist ideas of our times. Our aim is to help you, our audience, understand the full costs of the proposals and policies that are going to be impacting on your personal and your professional life going forward. Ultimately, we want to encourage more participatory democracy and to inspire more foresighted leadership. And this requires disseminating deeper, more unbipartisan discourse, debate and analysis around all sides of the big issues of our times. We hope you will join us. We hope you will debate with us because the future needs you and your voice too. So I'm Bronwyn Williams and this is The Small Print and we're here with Professor Jane Duncan who I'm going to hand over to to introduce herself the way you would like to be introduced to this conversation. Hi Bronwyn and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I am a professor in the Department of Journalism, Film and Television at the University of Johannesburg. Fantastic. So the purpose of this show that we're trying to put together is really to sort of unpack the small print, exactly that, the sort of terms and conditions and the nuances and the hidden unintended consequences around some of the more controversial or perhaps difficult issues that are impacting on people's lives. And what we really want to talk about today is what's going on with privacy, in particular, why it matters and where the limits are lying from a legal perspective, but then also from a public perspective, what we should be engaging with as citizens, as businesses, and as concerned members of society. I think that the topical issue here in particular is what's just happened with the whole RICA Act and what's happened in the courts there. So perhaps you can start off by just summarizing what has happened there and why it matters, why this case is important to citizens. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think most people are probably familiar with RICA um, because you have to go and get rica would um, So in other words, uh, in order to use a cell phone, you need to go into your phone shop and um, register your name and your ID number and your physical address. But RICA actually is much more than that. And it's actually a very important act and um, some aspects of it are very positive. Um, so for instance, it prevents the arbitrary um, interception of your communications without your knowledge. Um, and there are only very narrow circumstances under which your communications can be intercepted, which are very clearly spelt out in the act. And um, one of the grounds is um, that law enforcement agencies and the intelligence agencies can intercept your communications once they get a warrant, what Rico calls an interception direction um, from a specially appointed judge. And the grounds for the issuing of those interception directions are also spelled out um, clearly in the act, but there really needs to be a reasonable suspicion of criminality in order to intercept um, your communications. It also deals with um, other aspects around the interception of communications, including some card registration, um, but that is its main function, to regulate how, um, how communications is um, being intercepted. All well and good. Um, and the Constitutional Court case um, that happened just recently didn't touch on SIM card registration. So the bad news is that you still have to go and register your SIM card, in spite of the fact that my view is that it's, it's pretty useless as a crime fighting tool. We can always come back to that. Um, but there were very narrow areas that the Constitutional Court felt that RICO was lacking. So for instance, um, when people's uh, communications are intercepted by um, law enforcement agencies, they're never told that their communications have been intercepted. And that can lead to a situation where um, the agencies lie to the designated judge. And this has actually happened in the case of two former Sunday Times journalists, um, where the judge was told that they were not journalists, but they were suspected ATM bombers. And um, their communications was intercepted because they were writing critical stories about crime intelligence, the crime intelligence division of SAPS. So in future, and in line with what a number of other countries are doing, um, the Constitutional Court has said in future, if your communications are intercepted, you need to be told 
after the investigation has reached a non-sensitive stage. And if you're a journalist or a lawyer, because you have a professional duty to maintain the, the confidentiality of your communications, the lawyer needs to be, uh, sorry, the, the designated judge needs to be told beforehand. The procedures for the, um, for the appointment of the designated judge are not particularly independent. They're too tightly controlled by the Minister of Communications. Um, the entire process of, um, of granting interception directions is also inherently one-sided because the judge only ever hears from the applicants, the law enforcement agencies, their side of the story about why they want the interception directions. They obviously never hear from the, um, from the, the surveillance subject, um, the, the person who is the subject of surveillance which skews, which creates the potential of the judge being lied to. And also, um, there's no procedures set out for the storing and the processing of the information that is collected um, through, these, um, through these interception directions. And then lastly, um, there is a very um, secretive agency or very secretive center in a very secretive agency called the National Communications Center, which is based in the state security agency, um, which has been undertaking what we refer to as bulk interception or interception of massive amounts of communication where there is no reasonable suspicion of criminality. And the Constitutional Court has said that that is unlawful and unconstitutional because there's no law that governs how that actually happens. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. So when it comes to sort of mass surveillance and mass collection of data, is this intercepting live communications or is this storing, say, past data that people have put out? So either your, so your message history or past voice-based files, what is actually being stored and collected here? What are we actually talking about from a, from a layman's perspective? Yes, it's collecting um, live um, information about your communications in real time. Um, so very little is actually known about the process that's used in order to do that. But from what little we know um, of how mass surveillance occurs other, in other places, data is intercepted as it comes off the undersea cables. So in other words, as the cables land um, in the country. And then there is a certain amount of initial analysis that uses um, what the spies refer to as selectors or keyword search terms that initially sifts through the data that potentially may be of interest. And keyword search terms may relate to trying to identify whether people have an interest in being recruited by a terrorist organization, for instance. Um, that, gets, that gets initially identified, it gets buffered. So in other words, it gets stored for a certain amount of time for further analysis. And then once the agencies decide that there's something particularly of interest here, then they move that on for further analysis, they draw into that and then they start um, engaging in a certain amount of targeting to find out um, exactly what's going on in these communications. Um, so it is very much the, the, the live um, interception of communications as it's happening. And if you have been triggered by one of those phrases that has picked you up, say, to, in one of these sort of digital dragnets, at the moment, you have no idea that that's happened to you as a citizen, and you have no idea that you are sitting on some database on some particular watch list. Is this correct? That's correct, yes. Um, and I think what makes the, the operations of the National Communication Centre particularly um, concerning is that when the state security agency um, uh, put forward its, its founding papers, um, its founding affidavit in the case, it actually admitted that it's got no way of distinguishing between the communications that it's scooping up of, of South Africans and people outside the country. Because one of the arguments for um, uh, dragnet surveillance is that it's meant to focus on communications outside the country because the spy agencies typically have fewer investigative methods outside the country than they do inside the country. So therefore, whatever methods they can use, they should use um, to the maximum. That argument has fallen down precisely because the agency itself has admitted that it cannot distinguish 
um, between foreign and local communications. And there's a very good reason for that. If we consider the architecture of modern communications, if you store something in the cloud, for instance, or if you um, communicate with your friend, friend on Facebook, you are most likely communicating with foreign servers in the first instance, who then communicate back to you. So in the case of Facebook, for instance, if you're communicating with your Facebook friend um, in, in Cape Town for argument's sake, um, possibly, very possibly, um, your communications goes out to Facebook in the US, um, is processed in foreign servers there, and then a uh, Facebook um, communicates on your behalf back to your friend. Now that be could be considered a foreign communication. And as a result, in the, in the world of modern communications, it's impossible to distinguish local communications from foreign communications. And what that means in reality is that this is not just an abstract argument about a, um, a, a remote law that hardly anyone knows anything about and that doesn't really affect people and that as a result, an arcane judgment has, has been made that shouldn't really interest people. It, it means that it stops the state security agency from doing things like um, intercepting videos that you intimate videos that you may have sent to your nearest and dearest, stopping them from being stored on some state um, um, uh, database somewhere and possibly even um, stopping the sharing. Um, of that information with governments in other parts of the world, because this is what happens. Um, with mass dragnet surveillance. Um, there's a lot of intelligence sharing that takes place too. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, you've got to worry about how secure that data is in turn from other interests through things like cyber attacks and all the rest of it, because this data is all being st stored once again on some sort of a presumably centralized server that the spy agencies have access to. There's many layers to, to unpack there, but perhaps we can take a step back because as you were talking about now, when we're talking about communications, there's a lot more than just your cell phone calls and your text messages. We're talking about here also your social media data. Am I correct there? This all falls under the same, same act. So it's all the data we're putting out, which makes quite interesting questions, especially when we start considering the moral panic around say the terms and conditions change on WhatsApp, for example. So we focused on that and like switching quickly from, from putting communications out in our personal capacity using say WhatsApp because we think Facebook is bad and they're not treating our data well. We're switching to apps we think are more private like your signals or your telegram. But at the, main, mm -hmm. at the same time, there's a much deeper layer where a lot more surveillance is going on that no one is talking about or at least we are talking about it today. So from what really sounds like you're saying is that your your WhatsApp data is already being surveilled, but not just by sort of Mark Zuckerberg and the advertisers, it's being surveilled potentially by much deeper layers of the stack all the way down to the deep state. Am I articulating this correctly or would you add anything to what I've said? Uh, to an extent, you know, WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. And one of the reasons why it's end-to-end -end encrypted is user pressure um, to start generalizing encryption across our communications. And um, that was actually as a result of the Edward Snowden revelations that started in about 2013. And before he started revealing the full extent of the abuse of people's personal information, encryption was hardly ever used. Now encryption is almost the default um, in a lot of communications that we use. So, so what that means is that it's highly unlikely, actually, that the content of your WhatsApp messages are going to be decrypted and um, and 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 abused. Um, so, so I think that's that that's something to bear in mind. Um, it, it was quite interesting for me, um, for instance, listening to the uh, testimony of the um, of the Zondo Commission on the State Security Agency the week before last. And um, there was a very interesting altercation between the lawyers um, representing the Minister of State Security and the lawyers representing the Acting Director General um, of the agency about whether the Acting Director General should be um, testifying or not. And what, what came out of that particular altercation live on national television was that the minister and the acting director general had been communicating about these issues on WhatsApp 
the night before. So clearly, the State Security Agency knows something that perhaps we don't, which is that they have great difficulty. In fact, they may find it impossible to decrypt WhatsApp. Um, and in fact, this is one of the problems that this mass dragnet surveillance that has been undertaken by the spy agencies has faced. Because more and more data is being encrypted, they can't really do much with it. Um, so they are um, doing different things in order to circumvent that problem. One of the things that they're doing is they are hacking more. And the other thing that they're doing is they are using metadata more, which is data about our communications. And typically, metadata isn't encrypted. And there's an argument to be made that the picture that's built up about our lives from our metadata is far more um, invasive and far more telling of us, our interests, our movements, our friendships, our relationships, than content is. Because the problem with communication content is it provides a very small snapshot of what you're thinking and saying uh, at a particular moment in time. It takes a lot of interceptions in order to build up you know, what someone is thinking, whereas metadata, which is a lot less well protected um, than, than communication content, um, often provides a lot more richer information about us. But also, um, state agencies are hacking our communications as well. They are getting onto our devices. They're taking co control of our devices which means that they can access your passwords, they can access your WhatsApp, anything that you do on your device, they can do on their device if they've hacked your device successfully. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's exactly the, the message that I try to get across quite, quite often is that while we focus on particular corporations in the sort of surveillance capital world, we have to understand that there's much deeper layers where if your entire device is compromised, all your data on that device is compromised. And that's going to one sort of central point of control or failure, depending on, on how you'd like to look at it there. And, and I think that's that's also quite interesting when it comes to as you're talking about the metadata question there. So metadata is, of course, based on inferences. So like you have said, you can infer a lot more about people that and perhaps even know about themselves. I mean, marketers know this, you know, people don't necessarily know what they want, but your behavior reveals a lot about you. However, mm -hmm. from a more sort of economist point of view, inferences can be very, very dangerous because inferences can also be wrong. So, you know, you can get false negatives as well as false positives. And in fact, in these sorts of cases, when you're trying to flag people for potential criminal or terrorist based activity, a false negative can have absolutely devastating consequences for someone that has been singled out as being a threat. And just due to the sort of prevalence of people that do have bad intentions, you, you're more likely to pick up innocent people and be as being flagged as being guilty than you are necessarily to pick up guilty people, but it'd be when those things are actually flagged. I mean, that's just the way sort of statistics works when you're dealing with very, very large numbers. So what we're really saying here is that inferences based on metadata do result in innocent people being pegged as potentially dangerous and perhaps having more than just sort of surveillance, but actually getting dragged into criminal investigations. There have been some interesting case studies across the world. I'm not sure if you're familiar with any of those from your own work yourself that you want to talk about or even just the general point there, that we are, <laughs> and there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem with being sort of presumed guilty before you've been sort of tried in a court of law. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I think that there are a number of cases in countries that have adopted something called predictive policing or intelligence-led policing um, that uses the kinds of inferences that you're speaking about in order to be more, more proactive about policing and consequently to try and use policing resources a lot in a much more focused kind of way. But the problem is that it, it also leads to profiling as well, because you have to make um, assumptions, um, uh, inferences, as you're saying, but um, you have to make assumptions about who is likely um, to be uh, more predisposed um, to criminality. And that can lead, for instance, to you focusing your policing resources on black working class areas, for instance. Um, it can lead to you focusing on Muslims, for instance, um, which in turn can breed Islamophobia um, in the law enforcement agencies. 
So certainly um, prediction that uh, draws on inferences um, that can be taken from metadata um, it can really be a, an indication or a reinforcement of existing pre uh, prejudices um, that exist in these agencies. Yes, because of course, as you're saying, like any any algorithm that we use or any piece of technology that we use is based on some sort of inferences and those inferences tend to be biased towards the data that we already have. And as we know, sort of past behavior isn't indicative necessarily of future performance and people should hopefully in a just society be given the benefit of the doubt. This is why our legal systems are set up to say, you know, you're innocent, presumed innocence until you are proven guilty. And what it seems to me that we are working towards is a is a sort of dystopian open air prison kind of environment where vast swaths of your population are assumed guilty and treated as though they could be guilty without going through a fair process which really brings us back to the whole RICO court ruling which is more about at least telling people that they have been caught up in these dragnets and then at least have some sort of recourse. But that sort of brings the next question. If you have been flagged in one of these sort of digital dragnets that you're talking about, and you're now assuming that you have been informed by law enforcement agencies that you were caught up in it, your data was compromised or has been tracked, do you have any recourse if you are in fact innocent to claim back your privacy there, particularly as you're speaking about things like personal footage that perhaps you don't want the whole internet to know. And I, mean, I, I was just tweeting about this this week. I mean, my five-year-old daughter was, was filming me in the shower without me knowing, you know, and this goes on to iCloud and it's sitting there and like you find it and you find those files, and you take them down. But, you know, that's not data you necessarily want sitting on some law enforcement agent's, com agent's computer. And the point really is that even if you are innocent, there are things that shouldn't necessarily be in the public domain for, for, for mm. fun re or for any other sort of reason. Everyone's got some things that we'd prefer to keep out of the public domain. So do you have any comments there? Sure, absolutely. It sounds to me like your five-year-old needs to do Privacy 101. Um, but I, <laughs> the, the point that you're making about um, um, whether you'll ever be informed if you're caught up in the drag, drag, dragnet happily won't be an issue at the moment because there will be no dragnet because the Constitutional Court has shut down um, at least temporarily the National Communication Center in the State Security Agency, which is big, which is, which is huge. I can't think of any country in the world where a Constitutional Court has told a spy agency, um, well, today you've been conducting dragnet surveillance, tomorrow you stop. Um, and that's effectively what they've done. Um, rightfully, if dragnet surveillance is legalized in South Africa, and it could potentially um, be legalized at some stage in the future, because the Constitutional Court didn't say that dragnet surveillance in principle is problematic, um, which, which I think was a bit of a pity, but that may come up at some stage in the future. I think that dragnet surveillance in principle is a problem. Um, but all they said was that you need a law to govern um, how it operates, and also you need to make sure that that law has sufficient privacy protections in future. So if um, uh, uh, Bronwyn's um, uh, videos of Bronwyn in her shower taken by her five-year-old do land up being caught in the state security agencies, dragging it to some stage in the future, then yes, um, Bronwyn should be informed. And this is what um, you know, privacy advocates in other parts of the world are pushing spy agencies to do. That once dragnet surveillance becomes individualized um, and once an individual is targeted, then that individual should be informed. Um, that takes us back to the first area of unconstitutionality that Rika spoke about in relation to targeted surveillance, which is a different process to dragnet surveillance. But targeted surveillance um, has to involve um, a surveillance subject being notified that they have been put under surveillance. In future, that potentially could also apply to targeting that may take place once you've found yourself in the dragnet and you become a person of interest. Okay, but now does this ruling go back in time? Will people that have been caught up in South African security dragnets now be notified that they were either caught up in a dragnet or an object of particular interest to the state? Is it retrospectively applied or is it only applicable going forward? Just so people it's know, it's not retro retrospectively applied, sadly, but I see a um, 
a whole number of people knocking on the door of the state security agency headquarters in Pretoria, demanding to know whether they've been put under surveillance. Because the, the, the reality of the Constitutional Court ruling is that it's laid bare, like the Zonda Commission has laid bare, how our spy agencies have been running amok, um, how they have been practically um, almost completely unregulated. And I don't think that they're going to get a free pass on that. I think people are going to start um, demanding to know what has happened in the past, now that they know that what has happened in the past has been um, not acceptable <laughs> to the Constitutional Court. That's that's a very interesting point. So what you're basically saying is that if someone wants to find out, someone that's perhaps listening to this conversation wants to find out if they have been flagged as a person of interest, if their data has been compromised, they would be able to request that of the state. Is that true or is that not? True? Yes, 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 that's true. Um, but just going back slightly to the metadata, the metadata question, um, there's no procedure for you to be informed if your metadata um, has been has been obtained. And that for me is problematic because like you've been arguing, um, metadata may even be even more sensitive than content, precisely because of the potential for abuse um, if, if, if negative and in fact incorrect inferences are drawn about you. And yet accessing metadata is incredibly easy. Um, you do need to get a, a, a warrant, um, but it can be from a magistrate um, or a high court judge um, who may not know that much about privacy. And the only thing that the law enforcement agency needs to argue in front of the judge is that your metadata is relevant to their case, which is wide open um, to abuse. And as a result of that, We've seen um, the cell phone companies handing over our metadata thousands and thousands of times a year. There are far more metadata requests that are granted through the Criminal Procedures Act than there are um, RICA interception directions that are granted by the RICA judge. So that means that a whole load of our metadata is sloshing around um, all over the place. And um, we need to be extremely concerned about the lack of controls there. And when you're talking about that metadata and lack of controls, uh, you're not just referring to, of course, sort of state security agency abuses, but also the fact that our data providers or our cellular network providers are also selling that data to private sector yeah. entities or perhaps to international entities too. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, there, there, there have also been cases of where um, crookery uh, has been used um, in um, at least one cell phone company in order to um, get access to metadata, in order to track, you know, um, a possible infidelity um, on the part of a person's partner, so um, this is a very, very um, underregulated area and I think wide open to abuse. And one of the reasons why it's also open to abuse and the RICA judgment did really touch on this is that there's a, there's, there's a procedure around the blanket retention of metadata. Um, so RICA requires metadata to be stored between three and five years, which is massive. Many other countries don't allow that because they recognize that this is a, a honeypot um, for abuse, um, that is going to attract hackers, that is going to attract criminals, um, and they don't allow it. Um, and if they do allow it, they certainly don't allow it for, for three to five years. Perhaps you can also touch on if and how metadata does fit in with the poppy regulation too, because that for me, from a more private sector point of view, there is, there is an overlap there. But because as we have discussed, metadata in some ways doesn't really exist, you know, because it's based on inferences, not based on actuality. This is obviously slipping through various different cracks at the moment. And does poppy cover this at all? Or are we requiring entirely new legislation to bridge these very fuzzy divides when it comes to our data privacy? I think Poppy's 
quite strong, with the exception of one area that I'll touch on just now. But I think that Poppy is quite strong. Of course, um, we haven't really felt the strength of Poppy at the moment because the information regulator hasn't really been functioning. Um, I don't think sufficient resources um, have been have been given to the regulator as well. So it just hasn't been treated with the necessary uh, level of seriousness. And as a result, you know, the state and private sector companies have been making hay while the sun isn't shining on what they're doing um, with, um, with our data. Um, so Poppy is strong because it, it contains beta, basic and well-recognized, internationally recognized data protection principles. Um, so for instance, um, if you are a data controller, what, what the act calls a data controller, um, and you are collecting people's data, you shouldn't be handing over somebody's data um, and using it for another purpose without that person's permission. Um, there's this notion of data sovereignty that is um, firmly um, embedded in those data protection principles, which is that you have a right to control the circumstances in which your data is collected, how it's stored, how it's processed. You have a right to demand um, if data is incorrect, that the data is, is corrected. And you also have a right as well um, to demand that data is deleted if you have concerns about your data being abused. All those are basic rights that you can demand of data controllers. Of course, we've got a very long way in terms of public education for people to realize that they do have those kinds of rights. And also um, in order to ensure that data controllers enforce those rights. Where I think Poppy is a bit weak and where I think um, we may need to do a bit more work on Poppy going forward is that it has large carve outs for the law enforcement and intelligence agencies. So it says that um, Poppy doesn't apply to law enforcement and national security matters, except if you can prove that existing privacy protections are inadequate. Now, now that's an important caveat, because in relation to many areas of what these agencies do, you can probably prove that privacy protections are inadequate, like the Constitutional Court has just done um, in relation to uh, RICA, and I'm sure will be um, will probably do in relation to metadata and the Criminal Procedures Act. But still, I'm a little bit concerned about that large carve out. I think we should recognize that those agencies too need to be practicing basic data protection principles. And they need to spell out, for instance, the circumstances in which they're going to share our data. And there need to be limits on the circumstances when they do that. So for instance, let's think about a, another government agency that I think we, we, we hardly ever think about when it comes to these issues, which is the Department of Home Affairs. Um, so Home Affairs at the moment has a very, we know that it's running out a smart ID card system. And it's, it's, it's busy also planning a very ambitious establishment um, of a centralized, biometrically based um, national information database that will bring together um, several databases that contain um, people's biometric information, um, information about immigrants and refugees, um, information about people's um, uh, travels, um, who is entering and exiting the country. Um, so it's going to bring together a massive amount of information. Now you can imagine hackers sitting out there and thinking to themselves, oh, wow, this is a challenge. <laughs> Let's see how we can compromise this database. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a disaster in the making. Actually, it's creating a single point of failure. But one of the things that we know about the existing um, biometric database that, 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 that backends um, the, the smart ID card system is that the police have access to it. So they've got live and mediated access to the home affairs database. But on what circumstances are they accessing it? You know, are they accessing it in order to um, try and identify criminals? Or are they accessing it, um, you know, because they want to um, find out, you know, personal information about 
past lovers or <laughs> you know all kinds of things that they shouldn't be dipping into the um, the, the, the debate database to find out about. Rightfully, there should be a policy that governs the circumstances in, under which the police access that database, and it should spell out explicitly that that access cannot be abused in order to profile people um, who are politically um, inconvenient, for instance, critics of the government. Nothing like that seems to exist. Um, so, so these are the problems with growing the databases um, that exist in our public and private sectors. Um, the, 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 the rules that govern um, under what circumstances these databases should be accessed are not growing with the same speed, and that should concern us. Yeah, that's, there's, there's a few interesting points I want to pick up on there. The, the first one being about exactly what you're referring to there about like people not understanding necessarily how to manage their data or to ask the right questions to say like how this is could be abused and that brings me to a point around about the the whole india stack system that they're building and the contrasting to what you're saying with the south african system that's being worked on now with the, with the smart id cards and all the rest of it so india stack is quite similar that you do have a biometric based id card that'll be your ad hoc card that they're using mm -hmm. right now anyone can mm -hmm. sign up with it so you just need your fingerprints your they do your retina test, whatever, and they give you a number. But then they've got the second layer there, which is tied to the financial system, which they're trying mm. to sort of digitize, make the sort of the more digitized financial thing is then linked to your biometric data. But the third layer is where it gets more interesting, which is what they're building now. It hasn't been built out yet, but essentially they're making provision for data fiduciaries. So almost like you've got your like physical fiduciaries, you now have a data fiduciary, which would be set up to actually manage people's data on a slightly more sort of privacy focused level. And the fiduciaries job in that stack would be to make sure that clients that would be you and I data is only accessible by agencies or by third parties with correct permissions so those fiduciaries duty in that whole system would be essentially to guard people's data the same way the formal financial regulated system guards people's finances right now so it's obviously highly regulated requires a whole like whole lots of degrees of trust much much like you'd have to have to have a banking license or a financial advice license and that's how they sort of trying to develop the privacy layer there is south africa thinking of anything like this and before you answer that i suppose the other example that perhaps is doing a, a better job at the the privacy but still digitizing and accumulating the information required for a functioning society would be perhaps what estonia is doing with the e-estonia system which is mm. built from day one with a basically your information is shared on a need to know basis so it's verified but it's encrypted so very much right. like the whole data sovereignty thing that you were talking about earlier mm. is south africa going in the direction of any sort of data providence in that regard like that and is that something that we as citizens could be pushing for in any way and if not are they private sector sort of alternatives to try and sort of safeguard that our personal information is only accessible on a need to know basis and that we don't have excess data available for the picking from honeypots or disingenuous mm -hmm. connected entities or individuals. Mm. I think that um, South Africa has the ambitions to replicate ATA without necessarily replicating the privacy protections that ATA has been forced into and bear in mind that um, the ATAR system um, is uh, trying to um, engineer privacy protections into its functions, not because the Indian government, the Modi government is necessarily in love with privacy, but because it's been forced um, to build more privacy protections into it after huge scandals um, with the ATAR system. Um, and the ATAR system has been hacked People have found their personal details being um, transacted on WhatsApp, for instance. So, and, and these kinds of um, uh, uh, scandals um, have actually forced the hand of the Indian government. Um, it's led to court cases. It even led to a landmark judgment um, on the right to privacy um, being, being given by um, an Indian court. And all of these things coupled with um, uh, privacy advocacy um, I think increasing the effective privacy advocacy in India and beyond, I think has forced the Indian government to start taking um, privacy a lot more seriously. We aren't even starting to go down that road and perhaps 
we're going to have to see more uh, privacy respecting judgments um, coming out of courts like the Constitutional Court before we get to that point. Um, having a look at um, the Department of Home Affairs' latest digital identity paper, um, which has just been released and is circulating for public comment at the moment, um, I think it makes some gestures um, towards issues relating to privacy and data protection. Um, it recognizes the importance of open standards. And, but in doing that, it, it, it almost is like a cut and paste from some World Bank principles when it comes to protecting data, um, you know, in the context of digital identity. It hasn't really internalized that. Because on the one hand, it's giving all those motherhood and apple pie principles, um, you know, as, as a cut and paste from the World Bank principles. On the other hand, it um, it it has this um, incredibly um, overambitious um, plan to set up this um, mega honeypot of um, of at least three of our biometrics, um, all of our all of our travel information, um, all in one place. Um, it's even um, proposing um, storing DNA. Um, data, which really for me is, is extremely worrying. But it's telling us nothing about how it's going to secure this data. Um, you know, if anyone tells you that a large database of that nature could be protected um, from hacking, for instance, um, or from breach uh, by criminals, um, I think they are they're fooling you. Um, so putting those ambitious plans out there without spelling out exactly how they're going to uh, protect um, this most personal of data is, um, is hugely problematic. Because after all, if you're using a pin-based system, you can reset your pin, but you can't reset your biometrics. You can't reset your irises or your voice um, or your fingerprints. And I don't see any serious consideration um, being given to all of this. I think they're doing it all in the name of modernization. They want to be um, you know, at the center of government. They want all government departments to de be dependent on it. They want to monetize their data and sell it on to the private sector. They want to be in the thick of things rather than being some obscure government department um, stuck in some corner somewhere. So they are moving headlong into this whole modernization process without really considering the dangers of it. And I think that I would like to see information security experts becoming a lot more involved in these issues, because often the privacy debates that do take place are led by human rights activists who aren't necessarily techies. And I think one of the weaknesses that we have in South Africa that doesn't necessarily exist in other parts of the world, it doesn't exist in India, for instance. The tech community and the human rights community are often one and the same thing. Here, there isn't really a dialogue taking place between the techies and the human rights people. Um, they're talking past one another, and I don't think they're working together to address both the information security and the privacy issues. Um, and I think that this is a weakness also in civil society that needs to be addressed. You make a very good point there. And that's that's part of the reason we want to have these conversations to get more people thinking about things that have been sort of siloed or spoken about in certain pockets. Uh, I want to pick up on something that you said there about um, the government is, or at least some government departments are wanting to monetize public data by selling it to the private sector. Is that constitutional? Is that legal? Or is that something that civil society should be able to push back on? Because I think that's a worthwhile point to address because there's been such a lot of moral outrage against private companies selling voluntarily donated data, you know, there's data we sign away when we sign the terms and conditions to third party private sector entities, and conversely to government entities. Um, what, what recourse do citizens have against the public sector selling private data to other nations or to private companies? Because that's quite astonishing, actually, if because there was no terms and conditions we signed to allow that. It's not, we can't even put it down to ignorance that, that we informed without or we, we consented without being properly informed. This is something that you don't have an ability to opt in or out of. Sure, absolutely. 
I think it'll be difficult to argue that um, it's 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 not um, it's not lawful. However, um, I think they're going to have to put in place um, procedures that will have to allow people to give consent if their data is going to be unsold um, to people. If banks, for instance, are going to pay for um, accessing the home affairs database, um, I think it's going to be very difficult to argue against because obviously banks need to verify um, who we are um, when we go in order to open an account and anybody else for that matter, um, you know, in, in the private sector who wants to verify that a person is who they say they are. But I think that those kinds of procedures need to be spelt out very clearly in an identification act and people need to be able to um, um, complain if they feel that their data has been handed over for improper reasons. Firstly, they need to be very clear about the circumstances in which their data is going to be unsold um, to others. They need to know how long the data is going to be stored for, if it's going to be stored at all, or whether there's going to be live access and then book the access will end and then they will have no further access um, to that data. If it's going to be stored for how long, what levels of security um, are going to be, um, are going to attach to that data and when it's also going to be um, deleted as well, if it's stored. I think all of those things need to be set out in a foundational digital identity act. And there should be an act um, that will be debated and come onto the statute books at some stage in the future. But also, um, people should have some kind of uh, recourse. If they cannot opt out um, of um, being proved that they are who they say they are, because after all, the argument would be that if you're going into a company to transact with that company, you know, they have a right um, to verify that you are not, um, uh, that you're not inventing um, who you say you are. Um, so to an extent in a circumstance like that, you're forfeiting your right to say, no, you can't have access to my data. If you don't want them to access data from the home affairs database, for instance, then don't transact with that company. Um, but I think that you do um, have a right to have the procedures spelt out um, for what's going to happen to your data once it's accessed. Yeah, that also sort of begs the question around black box type identities and uh, verifying on a sort of need to know basis rather than actually transferring data. So basically encrypting those sorts of verification processes where it's where it's required. And that technology does exist. The precedent has been set up by other perhaps more technologically advanced governments. So I think the questions would be why we aren't adopting that, that sort of advanced technology at the same time that we're adopting the sort of advanced storage side of the technology, because there doesn't seem to be in today's day and age based on the way cryptography has evolved and the way decentralized technology has evolved that there's any logical reason to have all that data stored on centralized servers in one single point of failure why it can't be distributed and still do the job of verifying ident identities and various different aspects of our personality as as required on a need to know basis so it's quite interesting to me that these are not, this is not part of the initial rollout of these sorts of projects when other countries are already a bit further down the road. But I suppose that's that's a question for, for people in positions of influence above our own. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And I think that uh, distributed digital identity systems lay, make a lot more sense. Um, one of the arguments that Home Affairs has made about why they, they want to centralize everything rather than decentralize everything um, and run a modern distributed um, you know, information system is uh, because a lot of the information that exists on these different databases about people is inaccurate. Um, well, surely in a modern distributed system, you can find ways of automatically updating um, where different departments become responsible for making sure that when your personal information changes, that um, it gets changed further down the line on these distributed databases. Um, I really can't see that as being difficult, but I think that government has an interest in acting like a one-way mirror, um, particularly our government. Um, and I think it's, it's become complacent um, about the fact that we don't push back on these issues.
So increasingly, I think our government wants to see more and more of what we do and say, whereas we can see less and less um, of what government is doing and saying about us. The same can be said for the private sector as well. And I think it quite enjoys um, the continued existence of that one way mirror. Um, I think it, it, it benefits them. Well, of course, power begets power, but that's the that's the duty of a democracy and of a participatory democracy, which we should have, is for citizens to call their government to account because we pay them; they don't pay us. You know, that's it's kind of the other way around. The government exists to serve a democracy in a in a democratic state. And you do make a very good point there, in that we are at quite dangerous times when we start to see beyond de democratic powers to supposedly democratic governments, you know, that that can create quite a slippery slope situation. And what you're really saying is that there are different paths that governments can take. The options are there to have all the benefits of a modern digital society without turning into a surveillance state. But that's a choice that we get to make as a society, or at least the people in power get to make that choice for us if we don't participate in it. And I suppose the alternatives that we could be looking at is to see, for, as, I, as I mentioned, like Estonia is one particular sort of extreme example. Mm, Estonia is interesting. Mm. Without, yeah. without, at least by trying to protect privacy in name, even if not necessarily in nature, because no systems are perfect. But on the mm. other hand, you've kind of got your more China-based models, which I'm not even pretending to talk about privacy and are layering on now mm. central bank digital currencies, which really sort of encloses, I'm terming it basically a Wi-Fi curtain. So way beyond the sort of iron curtain, this is a an effervescent net that you cannot move from in the mm. physical world or the financial realm or the digital realm without being monitored and surveilled. And that really begs the question because these are different models of organizing society and the arguments to be made that we need to trade away more privacy to get more security or health and safety when we start talking about things like track and trace apps and bringing this sure. conversation into the, the COVID question. But what are we yes. giving away on the privacy side? So I suppose my question to you there would be is that we obviously have to find a balance because we obviously want to catch terrorists. We don't want to become victims of, of massive attacks. We do want to be able to control criminal elements, particularly in a society like ours, where there is such a problem with crime, we can't forget about those things. But what is the balance and where's the line when it comes to crossing over from getting sort of diminishing marginal returns to giving up privacy, but not getting any real security in exchange? Where do we draw the line and what, what at what point do we have to push back and say this far and no further? We're prepared to take on a bit of risk in exchange for having a bit of a right to be a free human being in a liberal democratic society. Mm, I think the, the where do we draw the line question is impossible to answer in the abstract. Um, it really depends on um, the sector that you're speaking about, um, the kind of information processing that goes on in that sector, and how sensitive that sector is in terms of the data that is being processed. So, for instance, we haven't even touched on artificial intelligence and how increasingly you know, AI is being used in a range of public and private sector functions. Now, for instance, one of the lines that should be drawn is that um, if AI is being used in order to process personal information, particularly personal information that may affect the rights of an individual, then that person um, should actually know that AI is being used. There should be a health warning um, if you like. You take labels. That's like, like organic system. labels on your fruit, right? <laughs> yes, there should be a health warning on that particular system um, so that you know um, that, that artificial intelligence is being used in order to make a decision um, that could potentially affect you in very drastic kinds of ways. Um, a bank refusing you credit um, for argument's sake or deciding whether you're a criminal or not. Um, so, um, in circumstances like that, you need to know, and you also need to know um, when you can have recourse um, or who you can have recourse to if you want to challenge um, a, a particular decision that's been taken um, through AI. You also need to be able to understand the inputs that have gone into the black box and the outputs that have gone into the black box as well, because AI engineers um, are probably, uh, you know, the designers of the algorithms are probably going to argue that that is their secret source and they, they can't reveal um, what has gone into designing their particular algorithms. 
But I think you do have a right to interrogate um, what data has been used in order to program the algorithms and to what end. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about um, what has gone into and what has come out of the black box. So those kinds of basics, for instance, allow us to draw a line in relation to the application of artificial intelligence. Um, I think in relation to um, mass surveillance, I think as we've already touched on, a huge big fat red line in the sand has been drawn by the Constitutional Court in relation to targeted surveillance. A line has been drawn in relation to metadata access. The line hasn't been drawn appropriately. Um, a lot more work needs to be done um, to draw it appropriately in relation to um, many private sector companies, the line isn't being drawn appropriately. I received a call this morning um, from someone who knew my name, had my phone number, um, and was trying to find out whether I was having any problems with, with, um, with the city of Joburg and whether they can take, take over the management of my services account. Um, so that kind of thing, for instance, um, I think is, is, is hugely problematic. Um, there are many circumstances under which people find their information landing up on, on some database and they have no control. Um, over who phones them and in what circumstances they um, that that data is used, and I'm sure you've had these kinds of experiences. I remember being uh, uh, phoned by a political party, which I won't mention, um, but one that professes to be seriously committed um, to to privacy um, and freedom of expression. Um, phoning me ahead of an election, um, they had my personal details right down to the point of knowing where I had lived and who I had rented my house out to, um, which was an absolute shocker um, to me. They knew where I voted, what voting station. So they had a whole profile um, of me. So those kinds of things, I think, point to the fact that um, organized society in South Africa, whether it's the private sector, political parties that may profess otherwise, um, and government um, from top to bottom, just isn't getting the line drawn right. Um, and I think, you know, it's often said that privacy is dead. Forget about privacy. We give away so much personal information. Privacy is a, is, is a fiction. It's not a fiction. It's not a fiction. The fact that people push back on very specific areas like Rika and win. The fact that a journalist like Sam Sol went all the way to the Constitutional Court and won um, this case. Um, and you know, there are other circumstances um, or other cases of, of isolated victories um, that, that we can think of. The fact that ATAR now is being forced to in, introduce more privacy protections um, is also a victory as well. So, Privacy is not dead. Um, the fact that WhatsApp has been pushed back um, in terms of its more invasive um, uh, terms of, of service that it's attempted to introduce by the, by the widespread um, global outrage um, about its, its, its data sharing um, plans, um, I think is an example that privacy isn't dead. In fact, I would say that it's alive and well it's ailing in certain areas, and I think it's certainly ailing in many parts of our life in South Africa, but privacy activism, I think, is winning important battles um, globally and hopefully increasingly locally. I love what you said there, and I think you make a very good point in that all those examples you gave is, is really saying that corporations and state entities will take as much as they can before they get resistance. But when we push back, we find we do still have rights, we do still have constitutions to fall back on, and we do have clout as consumers with the sort of how we engage with the companies that we engage with and what we give away. But it does require action from the citizen slash consumer to actually push back against these things. Otherwise, you do find that you'll end up giving more than you think 
that you've given away. And hopefully the examples we've covered today really do sort of drive that point home that there's a lot that's been taken without your knowledge, but at the same time, you have a right and almost an obligation as a citizen to push back on these things because in many ways privacy is a public good rather than just being a private good quite ironically in that you know an invasion of my privacy in my communications impacts someone else and that what we give up also affects what other people inadvertently give up too so i think that that's probably one of the big messages i take from what you've been saying is that as individuals and as organizations we have a duty to push back and we should take advantage of the, what, the laws that we do have on our sides and the recourse that we do have to defend what is left of our privacy, as you've been speaking about. But I think that's a pretty good point to end this conversation today. I don't know if you've got any closing remarks before we close off. Um, I think that privacy activism is alive and well. Um, I've just been doing interviews um, in, in relation to the digital identity system in Mauritius, um, for instance, and it's very fascinating, the tiny island of Mauritius um, sitting out there that um, many of us will probably just associate with um, um, sunny beach holidays. Um, it has a very interesting uh, political and civil society culture, and um, a lot of work has been taking place around privacy protections, and people push back there around um, the establishment of a, of, a, um, of a smart ID card system. And um, it, they pushed back um, to the point where um, the one-to-many database that allows their, um, their, their, their identity to be established by a, a centralized um, a digital identity database, um, it was actually dismantled. Um, there were mass uprisings about this particular system. I remember when I was there in 2014, there were um, uh, raging talk show hosts and public meetings and uh, community meetings taking place around all of this. And um, people didn't want their digital minutiae to be given to the government. They saw it as being incredibly invasive and it reminded them of slavery the days of slavery when they were compelled um, to carry um, identity cards, um, you know, on pain of, of being arrested. And such was the activism that it resulted in several court cases and eventually the one to many database was dismantled. Um, and there's an example of what can be done. So when people tell you that privacy is dead, uh, they don't know what they're talking about really. It's only dead when we when we say it is or when we give up on it right that's <laughs> that's what it comes down to but thank you Absolutely. so much Jane. uh thanks so much for joining us on the small print and discourse south africa and hopefully we'll be in touch soon thank you yes thank you very much i really enjoyed it